Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. We receive your word this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth. We thank you that you're opening the eyes of our understanding. Thank you for a spirit of wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of you. We're going to take hold of your word. We're going to pass the spiritual tests. And we thank you that there'll be much fruit that comes forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been continuing to share with you on the subject of God's covenant of holiness and the cleansing process to holiness and how we're to be washed spiritually so we can be clean and holy before Him. We've got to pass the tests. And we are talking about passing the spiritual tests in your life. We've looked through many scriptures in the Old Testament. This is actually the fifth session on just this aspect of holiness teaching. And we're going to pick up in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 28, here is where the apostles were brought before those that did not want them to preach the gospel. And in verse 28, they said, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, Peter and the apostles, other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The word ought is actually a word which is die in the, in the Greek, which means necessary. And if you actually look it up in Strong's Concordance, it means necessary as binding. It is a strong word, a covenant word. In other words, it is necessary as binding that we obey God and not man. Otherwise, we're not going to follow what man would say. We're going to obey the gospel. And so, here they were teaching the gospel. They were teaching about Jesus Christ. And they were filling the city of Jerusalem with the doctrine of the Lord Jesus. That's exactly what God wants to do in this city. God wants us to be involved with other Christians to fill the city of Phoenix and all the surrounding Maricopa County and all these areas with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody needs to hear the truth. and The filling of the doctrine needs to come forth as we do it then we're going to be obeying God, and God is going to be working to bring forth a harvest of souls. There is going to be a mighty harvest in these last days, and He wants to use you and me as we sow the Word in people's lives. Praise God. We want to pass the test. These guys passed the test. Instead of backing down, they said, no, we're going to obey God, and that's what you and I must do. We see, in fact, the Scripture in line with this that we were referring to when we were praying earlier, the fact that you and I have must realize that we are ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20. And we are to minister to people to be reconciled to God. If you're an ambassador for Christ, that means you've been sent forth. Ambassadors are sent from one country to another. What country are you from? You're from above. You're not from beneath. You are from above. You are a citizen of heaven and you are sent forth as an ambassador for Christ to preach the gospel to all those that are here so they can be reconciled to God. It says He's given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us has a ministry. You have the ministry of reconciliation. And God has entrusted unto us the word of reconciliation that we would preach the gospel. And when you preach the gospel, it's not beating people down. In fact, the Bible says that he's not imputing their trespasses unto them. You know, there's only one sin that the people are actually going to be convicted of. A lot of people think that, well, they need to confess all their sins and receive Jesus and get saved. That's not so. The Holy Spirit is not imputing their trespasses unto them. There is only one sin that the Holy Spirit is going to convict them of. In fact, it talks about here, in John 16, if we go back here, where it says He's come, the Holy Spirit, He's going to reprove or convict the world of what? Sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Sin is singular, not sins, but sin. And what's the sin? Because they believe not on me. There's only one sin, and that is not believing on Jesus Christ and receiving Him. When you believe on Jesus Christ, then the person will receive Him and come into relationship and be born again. Over in Acts chapter 6, you and I need to pass the test and be a witness for the Lord. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 5, this is when the, as we see back in verse 1, we'll catch the whole context, that 
there was a problem with the uh, Grecians were against the Hebrews and the fact that the widows were being neglected in the daily ministration, the ministering to their needs. And so they called the multitude of disciples and because they couldn't do everything, they needed the disciples to go forth and carry out this ministry. And they were looking for those who would be full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom to go and appoint over the business while they would continually give themselves to the prayer and the Word of God. And it says that they chose Stephen, among others, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. If you're full of faith, you're full of the Word, and you're walking in line with the Word of God, and full of the Holy Ghost because of the fact that they were praisers and worshipers, and they were praying so that they would bring a filling of the Holy Spirit, which comes forth through praise and worship and prayer. Well, as they went forth and did this, Stephen, in verse 8, full of power, full of faith and power. You see, as you get the Word in you, and you get filled up with the Word, you're going to be full of faith, and you're also going to be full of power because of the Word. What did he do? He did great wonders and miracles among the people. God wants us to go forth and do the mighty works of the Lord as well. Jesus said, the works that I do, you're going to do also. Well, there arose some, though, that were against them, of course. They were of the synagogue, of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and those of Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. Well, Stephen had the Word of God in him. He had wisdom. He had the, the knowledge of the Word. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. God wants us to get full of wisdom, full of faith, full of the Word, so that we have the wisdom of God as well so that we can speak forth that which people won't even be able to resist. They won't be able to resist the wisdom and the spirit that is coming forth out of you as you're speaking the word of God. Oh, these people, they got all upset. They said, they've suborned men, which said we've heard them speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God, stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, came upon them, caught them, and brought them to the council set up their false witnesses, said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. See, the fact was that the Old Testament was finished, the New Testament now came into being, and we're not under the law of the Old Testament any longer. We don't follow those things of the, of the Old Testament. We're now under the New Testament, following the laws of the New Testament, walking in. And he was saying, we don't follow after Moses or this law of the Old Testament any longer. Well, that really got them upset. We've heard them say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And that's right. That's exactly what Jesus came and brought. He brought a change from the old covenant, which was fulfilled by Jesus, and brought in the new covenant, which is of the Spirit. All that sat in the council looked steadfastly upon him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. I mean, he was just so full of the Spirit, he must have just glowed like an angel just coming forth. And then he began to preach the gospel to them. And he preached a message. And this message, he was declaring all the things, that the history of what had happened of the Jews, if you read through this. And we come down here in verse 51 of chapter 7, near the end of the message. And he says to them, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets which have not your fathers persecuted? They've slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you've now been now the betrayers and the murderers, who received the law by the dispossession of angels and have not kept it. They couldn't even keep it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were so mad and so upset. He, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Remember when Jesus went back to heaven, what was he doing? He sat down, having purged all of our sins. This is the only time you see Jesus standing up. He stood up. He wasn't sitting. That meant he was honoring Stephen because of his great witness, because he was full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom, and preaching the gospel boldly, and great signs and wonders and miracles occurred. And here he was confronting them with the truth that they would come to the place of repentance. And here he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Powerful. He says, Behold, I see the op heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Well, they couldn't take that. They cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and took him out there and began to stone him. 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes, a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Saul was right there watching all of this happening and approving of it. Yet later, the light, the, the light from heaven was going to shine on him, and Jesus was going to tell him a fact that, why are you persecuting me? And he ended up getting converted and turned around, and God carried on this ministry through Paul as he went forth. Well, they stoned Stephen. He was calling upon the Lord, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Here he was stoned. He was martyred. Same time, he witnessed powerfully. You've got to know that Jesus, he honored him greatly when he came up to heaven as he was standing, because this is a man who was full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith, full of wisdom, and spoke forth the Word of God with such wisdom and the spirit that they couldn't even resist it, did signs and wonders and miracles. God wants us to increase in the things of God. He wants you to get full of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to get full of wisdom, full of faith, full of power, and go and do the mighty works of the Lord so that we are going to be approved of Him and that perhaps you would see the same thing, that Jesus would be standing because of the fact that we have carried out what He's called us to do. What an honor that was shown forth of Stephen. We want to pass the test and be a powerful witness for the Lord. You need to get yourself praying in the Word, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. Learn everything of the Word of God so you are ready to speak forth the Word, to minister to those and to do the mighty works of the Lord. In Acts chapter 9, here we see another one who passed the test, and this is Ananias. Remember that Saul had come, and he had come from Jerusalem with the letters from the, all the chief priests and the council to go up to Damascus and to get all those that were believers and imprison them and drag them back and put them in prison. So he was doing the work of the enemy. Well, he got met by God, as we see back here in verse, look back here in verse uh, three, as they journeyed, he came near to Damascus. Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, 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 why persecutest thou me? He didn't know what was going on. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Boy, that got him. This guy was the chief one persecuting everybody who was following after Jesus. And now, here, he confronts him and shows him this. He was trembling and astonished. He said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And he told him to arise, go in the city, and be told what you must do. And so the men that journeyed with him stood speechless. They heard a voice, but they didn't see anybody rose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man because he couldn't see. He was blind for a season. They had to lead him by the hand, brought him into Damascus. But he was converted by that tre a tremendous thing that occurred to him. In three days he was without sight, neither could he. He didn't eat, he didn't drink. He was actually fasting for those three days and three nights. Now in verse 10, with this history, and everybody knew about this guy, a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias? He said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street that's called Straight. Inquire on the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. This is the bad guy. See, you've got to be sure that we learn to hear the voice of the Lord. God wants every one of us to recognize the voice of the Lord. He speaks in a still, small voice. He can speak through visions or dreams. And here he spoke to him, and he told him to arise. He gave him words of knowledge told him where to go, to the street called Straight, the house of Judas, tells him who's there, Saul of Tarsus, and he tells him what he's doing, he's praying. And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. God had already given Saul a vision. Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he's done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Nothing wrong with questioning the Lord about what you'd heard and what this guy's history was. Here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all the call on thy name. The Lord didn't take offense to that. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, he is a chosen vessel unto me. Otherwise showing the fact that, hey, this guy's been converted. And now he's a vessel for I'm going to flow through. To bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. I'll show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so he went on his way, entered into the house, put his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, indicating the fact that he was converted, he was born again. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, he revealed all these things, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. This is for the, for the ministry. This is not the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in him. The filling of the Holy Spirit, if you study it out, 
is talking about the ministry, the service of the Lord, and this is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that was coming upon him for the ministry that he was to carry out. And immediately there fell from his eyes have been scales and received sight forthwith, arose and was baptized. That shows the fact that he passed the test. He heard the Lord. See, we want to hear the Lord. We want to get ourselves in the Spirit such that we could hear the Lord. He wants you to get filled with the Spirit so that God could speak to you in a vision or a dream, bring revelation to you, tell you to do some specific things, give you words of knowledge, and that you would go forth and you'd be able to commune with Him. You know, we need to learn to hear the voice of the Lord. And then, of course, He was obedient and He went forth and did what God wanted. He passed the test. Here we see another case in Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion in the band called the Italian band. He was a devout man. He feared God with all his house. He gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Look at this guy. He wasn't even born again, yet he was seeking after God. The gospel had not come to the Gentiles yet. And he was devout. Look at the marks of this guy. He was devout. He feared God. He was a giver. And he prayed. That's what God wants to get established in you. You need to establish your prayer life. You need to be a giver. You need to be one that's going to have the fear of God. And you need to be devout in your everything that you do as you're seeking Him, following Him, obedient to Him, doing what He wants you to do. And he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him. God gave him a vision, saying unto him, Cornelius. When he looked on him, he was afraid, said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, My prayers, my alms are come up for a memorial before God. That tells you something. God takes note of your prayers and he takes note of your giving, of your alms when you give out to the poor, give out to minister to people. Be a vessel for God to flow through. Be a giver. Don't be one who is hoarding up just for yourself. Don't be one who just thinks about your own problems, but be one who prays. Be one who prays and be a giver. It came up as a memorial before God. Because of that, God visited him. And so he gave him the word, told him to send men to Joppa, call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And of course, he came. And Peter was contacted. God, of course, gave him the vision. And the men came and knocked on the door when the Spirit told him three men, that the men seek thee and you're supposed to go with them. And he came and he brought the gospel to them. And they got born again and received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, as we see at the end of Acts chapter 10. Cornelius passed the test. What put him in a position for this? He was devout. He had the fear of God. He was seeking after the Lord. He was a person of prayer, and he was a giver. That's what God wants in your life. You want God to pay attention to you and manifest himself? Be a person walking in the ways of the Lord, like what Cornelius was done, even before he was born again. Acts chapter 12. Here we see in verse 1, About that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Well, he saw it pleased the Jews. They wanted to eliminate the Christians. So he proceeded further to take Peter also. That was his plan. When he apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to all these soldiers. He was kept in prison, and prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What did the church do? Did they just give up? They just say, oh, no, here's another one that's going to get killed. No, they prayed. What happens when you pray? God is going to come on the scene. We need to be people of prayer. When a situation arises like this or any kind of serious situation, dangerous situation, whatever it is, instead we get into praying. And these guys were praying without ceasing. They were praying earnestly and intensely, stretching themselves out, praying continually. And what happened? Then, of course, Herod would have brought him forth, but Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. <coughs> Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, light shined in the prison, smote Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Peter was delivered because of the prayers of the church. The angel visited him and brought him out, out of there. Of course, he didn't even know what was happening. He thought he was still having a vision until he finally passed the iron gate that led out to the city. And that's where the angel departed from him. And that's when Peter finally came to himself and knew of a surety that the Lord had sent his angel and delivered him out of the hand of Herod. How the angels put in operation? Through prayer. When you pray, you can see the angels that are going to be sent forth. In fact, Jesus even spoke of this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 53. You know, the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for us, and you can put them in operation. 
as you pray the word. Matthew 26, 53, Jesus said, when they all came to get him, Judas leading the band of soldiers, he said, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Apparently that would have been the number of angels to deal with all the evil spirits that were working through those men. God will enable you to pray to the Father as well and send as many angels as are necessary to do battle for you or to deliver you. See, the angels are listening to what you are praying and they are ready to go forth and accomplish the will of God. You want to put your angels into operation. As the church prayed, God moved and he came and delivered them. They passed the test. We see in Acts chapter 13, another place where Paul passed the test. By this time, he's operating in the ministry. And we see in Acts chapter 13, we pick up in verse 6, they went through an aisle in Paphos, found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet of Jews, name was Bar-Jesus. He was a deputy of the country, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, and he wanted to hear the word of God. He called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Well, the devil's going to try to stop that. You cannot let the devil stop the things of God from going forth. What could Paul do about it? He had authority, remember? Elimus the sorcerer, so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. He was using witchcraft against them to try to get him not to hear the word. What did Saul do? He confronted him. We've got to be willing to confront and be ready to confront with the authority of the name of Jesus, the power of God to stop the works of the enemy. Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Notice, you've got to get filled up with the Holy Spirit. How do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? It's not talking about having the Holy Spirit in you. Filling with the Holy Spirit is through prayer, praise and worship, praying in tongues, brings the filling of the Spirit of God in you so that then the Holy Spirit will influence you in doing the things that He wants you to do as you're serving Him. He was filled with the Holy Ghost, set His eyes on Him, and He said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteous, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? We need to get bold. We need to get rid of all the fear and the timidity and the fear of man or the fear of the devil or fear of a witch or whatever all. We got authority. We got dominion. He went and confronted Him. He said, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon him, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. He went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. He brought a judgment upon him. God can use you if it's a situation arises to bring a judgment on someone. God wants us to be, of course, you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Only when the Holy Spirit shows you to do such and such do you do this. Same time, though, here, what happened? The deputy, which he saw what was done, believed. Oh, yeah, he believed. He, that did it. Stopped the works of the devil. He tried to stop him from receiving Jesus and hearing the gospel. The devil's works got stopped. God was exalted. And this guy became a believer. And they were astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. This is the doctrine of the Lord. Well, you and I are to walk in that same doctrine and to see those same mighty works be done. Here's another case. See, you can't let the devil stop you. Is the devil trying to hinder you even in your own life? You've got dominion over the devil. You are to rise up and take authority and stop his works. Acts 16. Here's where they were preaching the gospel. And in verse 16, it came to pass as they went to prayer, certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. This is one of the enemy's workers. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. It sounds like it was a good thing that this guy, this uh, woman was saying. If showing you the way of salvation, when, what was such a problem with that? Well, it was a mistranslation in the King James. When you have the, the word the, that is a definite article in the Greek. And it is always translated the when there is a definite article. If there is not a definite article, then it is never translated the, it would be translated a. In, the, in this case, there is no definite article in the Greek. Young's literal translations corrects the error by declaring, who declare us a way of salvation. <coughs> Why was this a problem? They were saying, these are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us a way of salvation. What's that saying? They were proclaiming, they're showing you a way of salvation, but we're also showing you a way of salvation. And there's all these other ways of salvation. What do we see even going on in our country right now? People proclaiming, just get to God, 
but whoever your God is, however your way is, to get the God. Thinking that there is a way to your God, you just follow your way. And what do we see? People want to preach this universalism and this uh, every, just accept everybody, all their gods, whatever way, and they got all these different so-called Christs out there or whatever. No, these are all false ones. This is all false things that are going forth. There is not a way, whatever way, you want to make it to salvation. There's only one way, the way, which is through Jesus Christ. No other name given among men whereby men must be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, so, otherwise they were deceiving the people as they were declaring this. This she did many days. Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, he allowed it to go on apparently for several days until he discerned this properly. For some, it doesn't say why he let it go on for many days. But he finally said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. He cast the devil out of this woman, spirit of divination that was operating, soothsaying, to deceive the people. Now let me make a comment here. I've, heard, I've told people, we always tell them the fact that you don't cast demons out of unbelievers. You might say, well, here's a case where somebody had the demon cast out of them. Why was that? This didn't set the woman free from the bondage of the enemy. This broke the power of Satan working through her. The only time you're going to cast a demon out of a person who is an unbeliever is if you're destroying the work of Satan operating through that person, which was a spirit of divination operating as a soothsayer through her. So that's a case where you would do that. Of course, it did not bring her into relationship with God. It did not set her free from bondage. She was already in bondage. So this is the only type of a case where you would cast a spirit out of a person to destroy the work of Satan operating through them. It's not going to get her free. I'd point that out. So here he passed the test. He wasn't going to let this demon continue to operate through this one. He confronted it and he cast the spirit out. Notice it didn't come out right away. It says he came out the same hour. Apparently he had to keep dealing with this one until it came out. You just keep on coming against the devils and casting them out. You have authority and dominion and you can stop these works and it may not come out right away but it will come out and you will get set free. Praise God. Well, when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew him in the marketplace under the rulers, brought him the magistrate, saying, These men being Jews do exceeding trouble in our city. They teach customs that are not lawful for us to, to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates rent their clothes and commanded to beat them. And here they laid stripes on them, cast them in the prison. Well, it looks like here, hey, we did a good job cast the devil out of this girl, stop the work of the enemy, and now the devil comes and throws us in prison. Well, is God going to be there? You better believe it. Don't think for a minute that it was all over for them. Well, here they now, they're in the inner prison, their feet are fast in the stocks. At midnight, that's like synonymous with the darkest hour, Paul and Silas prayed. Do you have a lot of negative things coming against you right now? You got a lot of financial pressures. Do you have physical sickness, disease? You got things coming against your mind. You got things going on in your body. Do you got things that are working in circumstances in your life? It might seem like the darkest hour. The Lord will deliver you and bring you out of that. At midnight, what they do? You don't give up. You want to pass the test and continue to do what God says. God is faithful to deliver us. He prayed. They prayed and they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. What's that mean? They just didn't uh, sing them real quiet so nobody would hear them. They were singing them boldly. All the prisoners heard these guys praying and singing praises unto God. That shows boldness. And they weren't going to just be real quiet and not bother people. No, they were speaking it forth. And they also would have been preaching the gospel because the jailer heard about the gospel as well. And certain, suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken immediately. All the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. God go move. And God moved on the scene and just broke that thing. Everyone's bands were loosed. The keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword, would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we're all here. And then he called for light, came in there before Paul and Silas, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How'd they know about being saved? Because not only were they praising God and praying, but they were preaching the gospel of how to be saved. 
You see, they weren't going to be uncomp. They weren't going to be backing down just because they were thrown into prison. God does not want you to back down from preaching the gospel. People need to know the truth. They need to have you present the gospel to them through a printed page or whatever, speaking to them. And these guys heard the word. And so the miracle happened. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved in thy house. And the result was they got saved. See, they passed the test. Paul and Silas passed the test. They dealt with the spirit of divination, cast that thing out, ended up in prison, but they continued to praise and pray and do the things of God and preach the gospel, and God delivered them out of it. You got to know, don't ever back down from the things of the Lord. And even if the devil counterattacks against you, which is essentially what happened after he cast the spirit of divination out, now they're going to get you and throw you in prison and wipe you out. No, the devil might counterattack against you in some aspect in your life. You keep coming against the enemy. You keep praying. You keep praising. You keep casting out. You keep the pressure on. You keep preaching the gospel and doing what he says. God will be on the scene, and he will bring forth deliverance, and he'll use you. As this case, the jailer and his house ended up getting saved. Praise God. He passed the test. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. Here it speaks of those when Paul and Silas came into uh, Berea. They, were coming, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And it said, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. That tells you something. As the word comes to you, you need to have a ready reception of it. This is the word decamai, a welcoming, accepting of the word of God with readiness of mind. You need to have a readiness of mind a zeal, a readiness to receive God's Word. At the same time, you better be sure it's the Word of God. They search the Scriptures daily, whether the things were so. It is important that you search the Scriptures daily to be sure anything that you hear. Here, you're seeing the Scriptures, and you should check everything out. If you ever have any question, <coughs> you always check it out in line with the Word of God. <laughs> if you hear things from others, you got to check it out in line with the Word of God. If someone's not bringing you things that are in line with the Scriptures, then you do not receive it. It is your responsibility to know the Scriptures. You see, if all the believers knew the Scriptures and were checking things out, they discover all these things that are coming forth that are not true, that have been taught out there. And there's been much taught that's contrary to the Word in the body of Christ, unfortunately, and we wouldn't have all the problems that we have. So it's your responsibility, my responsibility, that we search the Scriptures daily, whether or not the things are so. Receptive to the word, but be sure you're not being deceived. Acts chapter 19. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper coast, found certain disciples. What's he say? He's going to preach the gospel to them. You say, well, the disciples, they're born again. That's all I need to do. No, he said, hey, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Receiving the Holy Spirit comes after you're born again. When you're born again, what happens? You get the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You've got a brand new spirit. But the Holy Spirit is received, and that's the correct biblical term for the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. It's receiving, which is the Greek word lambano, which means to take hold of and take into yourself the Holy Spirit. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? You know, when you go out witnessing and you find someone that's born again, you say, praise God, you're born again. That's what's your next question for them. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? You want to find out if they receive the Holy Spirit because the majority of Christians out there have not received the Holy Spirit yet. They thought they got the whole package when they were born again, but that's not true. The Holy Spirit is received after we are born again. They didn't even know as much would there be any Holy Spirit. Well, he ended up uh, down here in verse 6, laid his hands on him, the Holy Ghost came on him, was received, they spake with tongues and prophesied. And it even says here that all the men were about 12. There are about 12 people who he was able to minister to and get to receive at this point. And so what did he do? He went into the synagogue, spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now we're talking about disputing and persuading. That's not arguing, but that is disputing and persuading, bringing forth the truth to counter the things that people would believe that are contrary to the word. Don't ever let yourself get into arguments. You don't get arguing. You don't get anything, bad, negative attitudes and so forth. You bring the gospel, you share the word with the person, you do or need to dispute and persuade the things concerning the kingdom of God. He was passing the test. Now, 
How long do you do that? You're not going to do that forever, because here when diverse were hardened, they believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from unseparated disciples. There's people that you're ministering to, you don't want them to be around that kind of evil. And so he did the right thing and separated disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. He passed the test. He was everywhere he went. He was, you know, when you go to preach the gospel to people, you locate where they are. If you find out that they're born again, then you talk to them about the Holy Spirit. Help them to get their prayer language. And then begin to train them up in the ways of the Word of God. Begin to make disciples of all nations, as the Bible says. And they continued by the space of two years, so that all they that dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. What does the body of Christ need to do? The body of Christ has got to arise and start taking the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person. If all of us will start reaching out to people, getting the gospel into people's hands, sharing the word with them, the ones that are born again, helping them to receive the Holy Spirit, helping them to get their prayer language, the ones that, that reject it and are getting hardened and so forth, you shake off the dust off your feet, go and find someone else. And you continue to minister to the disciple, people to raise up disciples. God wants the body of Christ to get involved in doing these things. He passed the test. Well, there were some that were seeing what Paul was doing. In fact, we go back a moment. And it says God, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul and that even the anointing from upon hand, handkerchiefs and acrams, aprons, uh, the, the diseases were departing out of them and evil spirits went out of them. The anointing is transferable through aprons or handkerchiefs or prayer cloths or whatever and they can bring forth healing and drive the demons out of people. Certain the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them that had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Here they were trying to do something, and yet they didn't have a revelation of God themselves. They weren't born again, and they were just trying to do something that someone else is doing. That shows you, you've got to have your own personal faith with Jesus. You can't decide you're going to try to do something that so-and-so does. This is not only true in this, but in any aspect. Whatever aspect of ministry you have, you carry out what God has given unto you. Don't try to do something that somebody else does. You do the things of the Word of God and according to the giftings and the things that God has placed in your life. Well, what happened? These were ones that tried to cast the demons out. The evil spirit said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. See, he knows the ones who are right with him and those that have authority and are doing the work of God. He says, who are you? Of course, they, he, the evil spirits didn't know them because they weren't in line with the Word of God. They weren't even born again. And man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on him, overcame, prevailed against him, so they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This is known to all the Jews and Greeks that dwell in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. The fear of God came, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And that's going to be magnified for those that know him. Now, don't let this deter you from thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't try to cast out a demon. You have authority and dominion over demons. You can cast them out. You have dominion. But you don't ever want to try to cast something out if you're not born again and right with God, which is what they did. And they, of course, made a mistake, and they ended up paying for it. We see also, as they were preaching the gospel in Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 20, Paul said, How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. That's what God wants. And God wants to raise up the Christians in this church and all churches, if they'll listen, to go and preach the gospel, house to house, person to person, publicly. You know, I'm on the radio here, as we get more money will come in in time, we want to be on the TV. We want to do it in every way aspect, as well as house to house. That's why we had 100,000 of those good news for you printed, so that we can take them and get them into the hands of people, as well as talking to people about Jesus. This is a means for us, and it's our responsibility. And God wants to use every single one of you to get the gospel out to people. Here he kept nothing back, and he taught publicly and house to house. You and I have a part to play in the ministry of Jesus, and we need to be responsible to carry it out. Here, they passed the test. He didn't hold anything back. He wasn't one of these guys who was going to teach him certain things. He held back nothing that was profitable. He taught the whole counsel of God, and that's what has to come forth, and that's what you're going to hear here. You're going to hear the counsel of God on every subject systematically over time. And we won't sugarcoat things. We won't hold things back and ignore things that people don't want to talk about. 
We're going to talk about deliverance and casting out demons and sin and dealing deal with all these things. We're going to talk about it all because we cannot hold anything back. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. See, we're going to pass the test. I got to pass the test. You got to pass the test. We need to pass the test and we're going to pass the test. We're not going to compromise because we're going to serve the Lord and be obedient to Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is commonly reported there's fornication among you. Such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. That was incest. Even the Gentiles, the world didn't even do that. And yet it was going on in the church, incestual relation. He says, you're puffed up and have not rather mourn that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. Otherwise, you've got to deal with this thing. You can't let that go on in the midst of the believers. You know, I see in many churches today, I saw it when we were in Ohio, I see it here as well. A lot of people, a lot of churches, fornication is rampant in the churches. It should not be rampant in the churches. Instead, it needs to be dealt with. And people that are in fornication need to be called to repentance. And if not, they have to be disfellowshipped. You cannot allow that to go on. Verily, as absent the body, but present spirit, have judged already as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one into Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. By the way, when it says the spirit may be saved, this wasn't an automatic guaranteed thing. The reason you know that is because it happens to be in the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. And what would the condition be for him to be saved in the day of the Lord? That he would repent. He'd have to repent and turn away from it. But they weren't going to sit there and they couldn't allow him to continue in the church with this. They had to disfellowship this guy and turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, which is what's going to happen as you walk in sin. And they had to deal with this, but they wouldn't deal with it. So Paul had to deal with it. That's important. That's why we have to deal with any kind of areas of sin. Someone's going to walk in fornication, and we find out, you know, we're going to encourage you to come to repentance, of course. You know, he always gives people space to repent. At the same time, if it, can to, it has to be dealt with. Otherwise, a person has to be disfellowshipped. And Satan will come in and bring destruction. We see another place over here in Galatians 2 where we need to confront things. So we see a lot of the things that it talks about in passing the spiritual tests. It's confronting the enemy or confronting situations that we need to deal with. Here in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> Acts 2, verse 9. Here is where Paul comes to Peter. It's also his name was called Cephas, Peter. James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars. This is when they were, he came to Jerusalem. He perceived the grace that was given unto me. This is Paul speaking. And they gave to me and Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor the same I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, he came to visit them. I was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. What was the problem with Peter here? Remember, he was a Jew who got converted. And instead of coming out of all these Old Testament things, he was in compromise. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Oh, he was eating with them when, when the Gentiles were around, with James. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. Otherwise, now the other people that were the Jews that had got born again of the circumcision, there, he was afraid of them, so he wasn't going to be in fellowship with the Gentiles that got converted. He was in compromise. We cannot be in compromise for the gospel's sake. We must preach the gospel, and we can't have compromise or respect to persons. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was carried away of the dissimulation. Otherwise, it was starting to affect Barnabas, who was the guy who was traveling with, with Paul. But he was saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't be having fellowship with them. It was starting to affect him. You've got to stand up for what's right, otherwise it's going to affect other people around you. He had to confront them. When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, and he seemed to be the chief pillar of them all, remember, you know, Peter and John and those, I said before them all, he didn't take them aside, he came right before them all. He said, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles. 
Knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we believe in Jesus Christ, we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so he confronted him and dealt with this thing. He says, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found to be sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. He says, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I might make myself a transgressor. What was destroyed? The law and all the things of the Old Testament. If you go back into doing those things, you make yourself a sinner, Peter, and all you pillars. And so here, he confronted him and dealt with it and began to preach, of course, the gospel and tell them all these things. We need to confront people. When there is error, we need to confront people and share the gospel. Not for the purpose of, oh, I know the truth and you don't, or trying to make us look like we're better. It's with humility, with meekness, to restore a person who's overtaken a fault so they can come to the place of repentance so it won't contaminate other people, and that's what was happening. Paul passed the test. He didn't sit there and say, oh, maybe I shouldn't say anything because of these guys, you know, that's the way they're doing things over here. Oh, no. He was serving the Lord. And he was going to, comp not compromise, but confront them on the situation. We see over in Colossians, in chapter 4, here we see another person, and this person passed the test. This is talking about Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ. He was a servant of Christ that says, He was always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. The word laboring fervently, when you put the cursor over it, it's one Greek word. And it's the Greek word agonizomai, which actually means to contend with the adversary. It is the same Greek word that is translated fight in fight the good fight of faith. It's translated fight three different times. So what was he doing? He was fighting the good fight of faith, contending with the adversary in all prayers that they might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. God wants all of us to enter in to praying for one another. You need to be a person of prayer. You need to not just be praying for yourself, but praying for others, that they might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And you're going to pray with all manner of prayer and enter into contending with the adversary. You are in a warfare. The whole body of Christ is in a warfare. It's a spiritual warfare. God wants you to contend with the enemies and begin to pray for others and enter into the warfare. You know, if we're not doing these things, are we really passing the test of what we're supposed to be as believers in Jesus Christ? Demas, over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, here's one who did not pass the test. Paul makes this statement. He says, Demas, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Oh, he liked the things of this world. He wouldn't separate himself from the things of this world. He made a mistake. In fact, all these people were departing from him. Paul couldn't, he said, only Luke's with me. And, he could, and all these people were departing from him. They, they weren't continuing in the ministry. This guy forsook him because he loved this present world. God says that you are to be separate from this world. Friendship with the world makes you an enemy against God. We are in the world, we're not of the world. You do not want to partake of the things of this world. If you are allowing yourself to be involved in all these worldly things, you are are making a mistake. God wants us to separate ourselves from the things of this world. We're not to love this present world. Remember, this world is going to pass away, but the things of the Lord are what are going to stand, and we need to walk in His ways. Here we see another one who caused him problems and failed and did not pass the test. It was Alexander the coppersmith. He said, He did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, and God will. Don't worry. What a man sows, he's going to reap. Of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Now, some people think that you shouldn't ever say anything about a person. Well, I shouldn't say anything about such and such a preacher or minister or somebody because I might be doing the wrong thing and gossiping. If your motivation is just to put somebody down and to speak negatives, well, of course, that's wrong. But what's the motivation? The motivation was to help these people from being deceived by this man. It says he was greatly withstanding our words, and he wanted everybody to be aware of this. And so this is important that you understand that, yes, we do need to speak against what other people are speaking if it is wrong, and they are walking contrary to the Word of God and not receiving the gospel in order to protect other people. What's your motivation? 
for do, making things straight in line with the gospel. So don't think that you can't speak about people. It all comes down to your motivation. But if you just want to run somebody down, that's wrong. At the same time, we've got to deal with things. If people are preaching the gospel, for instance, when one particular guy some years back was pe preaching the gospel of universalism and Unitarianism and that everybody was going to be saved and so forth, including the devil, well, this guy, he had to be dealt with. This particular minister, he was confronted by the Christians in his particular town, the ministers, and they dealt with this guy and called him to repentance. He wouldn't. Today, this, this guy lost his whole church. He made a mistake, and he went in the wrong direction. He's, I don't know where he's at today, but he sure made a mistake, and he withstood the words. But nonetheless, we've got to be willing to confront people that are walking wrong. This is all a part of the gospel. Now, we're going to look in Revelation, before we close tonight, in Revelation chapter 2. Because there's many things that are spoken here of which you and I must be aware of to pass the spiritual tests. In Revelation chapter 2, here to the church at Ephesus, and we see to each one of these churches in Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches, the first thing that he says in every case in the King James is, I know thy works. Actually, it's not the word know. You put the cursor over, it's the word see. I see, in every case, it's always the word I, I do not the word gnosko, which is means to know. Why they translated that, I don't know. He literally says, I see your works. And that's the first thing he says to every one of these churches. God sees your works. Your works are important. Your works show forth your faith. Your works show forth whether you're following Jesus or not. We can't be one of those just believe and then don't do the things that he says. No, we gotta be those. He says, why do you call me Lord? You don't do the things that I say. We, you know, you can't just declare he's Lord and think he's Lord and everything's fine if we don't obey him. No. And your works are going to show forth your obedience in you know, doing the things he wants you to do. And also your labor, our labor of love. And the patience, which is steadfastness. And how about can't not stand, cannot bear them that are evil. Again, we've got to come to the place of confronting those that are evil and that are doing wrong, evil things. Thou hast tried them that say they're apostles. There's lots of people that say they're apostles and prophets and all these things, and everybody wants to tout their ministry and claim their ministry and all these things, say what they are. Well, are they really one or not? And you're going to find out. We already gave you the, the illustration some time back where people that claim to be apostles and prophets and supposedly the top ones in the nation were speaking these great words of, of approval and power and authority and and can, putting it over this one particular person that supposedly had, was bringing forth this great revival that was supposed to be happening in America that was broadcast through the God TV to 400 million homes throughout the world. And this man was involved in adultery with one of his people on staff at the same time. He's now divorced. He married this girl. He also was listening to an angel who was a female angel called Emma O., there is not female angels in the Word of God. They're all male. It was a devil. And all the things he was doing was demonic activity. It could not have been the Lord, because God does not do things. Certainly, he's not going to operate through someone who's out there committing adultery with someone at the same time as supposedly conducting some great worldwide shaking revival where people were coming from all over the world. And yet the apostles and the prophets stand up there and put their mark of approval on him and say, now you have great authority and you have great power and all these things. Well, this is a case where we got to try them. Hey, is these guys really apostles and prophets? Why didn't they pick this up? Why didn't they, if they were really in tune with the Lord, they should have picked up immediately. Hey, this guy's not right. There's something wrong here. But they didn't, none of them picked it up. Are these guys really apostles? Are these guys really true prophets? What's the problem? We got some problems in the body of Christ. So these guys had to try them and find out if they're true. You and I have to do the same. We're not putting people down. It has nothing to do with that. It's finding out what's true and what's false because we got to know what's true so we don't follow after something that's false. He's found them they're not and found them to be liars. And that's serious business. And he talked about how these bear, they were bearing things and has patience, steadfastness, and for my, by my name's sake has labored and is not fainted. So what do we see? Here's several things that are important. Your works are important, your labor, your steadfastness, your 
dealing with things that are evil, and you're also trying and testing those that say they're such and such to find out if they really are or not. And that you are going to labor for his name's sake and you're not going to faint. We're not going to faint. No. We're going to continue in the things of the Lord. We're not going to draw back. It's amazing. There's so many ministers out there have fainted and have quit the ministry. Lots and lots of them. Tremendous amount. They fainted. They haven't continued in the things of God. It's not what God wanted. If the call of God was on their life, they should be carrying it out and going forth. But then he also brings something else out. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Who's our first love? Jesus and the Word of God and following Him. Apparently now they were doing something else. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. That meant they were right at one point, but now they were fallen away. You can be right at one point, but then fall away. That's why you always got to be on guard so you never fall away from Jesus being your love of your life. He said, repent and do the first works. What's going to show true repentance? How do you know? By their works, by their actions. Bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, remember John the Baptist said. Or else I'll come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That's quite a statement. These guys could have the light, the candlestick, or his uh, manifestation of his presence removed out of them. And he goes on and says, This thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, this is a good thing. They hated the deed of the Nicola Nicolaitans. What is this talking about? The word Nicolaitan comes from two words. The first word is Nikolai, Nicol, Nicol it is. And the second one is laity, Nicol and laity. This particular word means, Nico means conquer. We, do, we get our word Nike or Nico is the word for conquer. And laity means people. What is this? This is the conquer the people spirit that was operating through the people that were in ministry. And we see this problem in the body of Christ today. It is rampant. We see the clergy and the laity, this kind of separation. Is there a separation of that in Scripture? No, there is no such thing. Those that are believers that have ministry gifts, they're to carry out the ministry gift that God has given unto them. But are they up here and everybody, the laity are way down here, like we got some big division? No, that is a lie. The deeds of the Nicolaitans, they were conquering the people, exalting themselves. We see the Jezebel spirit which is a controlling, dominating, manipulating spirit, has come in, unfortunately, to many churches today. It's not good. We should never have those things. And we also see this Nicolaitan spirit because people want to tout their so-called calling or over all the people. And they especially want to tout their calling because they always want to be addressed by apostle so-and-so, prophet so-and-so, prophetess so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, some title before what they are. They want their title exalted, being put forth. Do we see that anywhere in the Word of God? Never. Never do you see anybody given their title first before their name. It always says Paul, an apostle. You look at it, look it up and check it out. I've checked it out. All the ones on apostle or all the ones on prophet, so and so, a prophet. It's not where someone has their title first. What is this? This is men exalting themselves. By the way, he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Who gets all the glory? Jesus, not men. Why do people do these things? Because they're exalting themselves, and they also want everybody to look up to them that they're some special thing. No, that's a wrong attitude. What, who's the greatest? The servant of all. Since when do we put ourselves up here, you know, and think so everybody will think we're something? That is a mistake. This is what I've said for years, and I say it to you today, as well as you'll hear it in the future. I am just a believer with a ministry gift, and I'm responsible to carry out what God has given to me. That's why people say, what do you call me? My name is Dave. You can call me Dave or David or whatever you want. You can call me Brother Dave. You can call me whatever. If you want to call me Pastor Dave, you can. But you'll never hear me introduce myself as Pastor so-and-so. When I go to introduce myself to you, if you remember when you came here, I said, hi, I'm David Middleton. That's the I, way I introduce myself. Because I'm interested in just being, I'm a believer just like you, but I have the ministry gift. I have to carry out my calling, whatever it is. But I'm not playing the exalt me game. 
because that is the Nicolaitan spirit, and it is no good. He says he hates this. God hates these things that he sees. I know some guy, he always writes and always says, he's Bishop so-and-so, always Bishop so And when he called up, he used to say, hi, this is Bishop so-and-so. You know what I would say back to him? I'd say his name. I'm not going to say his name. You'll never figure out who it is, but I'd just say, hi, so-and-so. I refuse to sit here and play the title game. I'm not going to do that. I just tell him, you know, be nice to him, say, hi, so-and-so. And when I'd call him or whatever, I'd say, I'm, this is David Middleton, how you doing? Otherwise, not going to play this title game and exalting us, you know, whatever we all are. That is a prideful Nicolaitan, conquer the laity, I'm something great spirit, which God hates. He hates these things. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You and I are to overcome and conquer. So we want to pass the test. How about the next one? This is the one at Smyrna. He says, I know thy works, each one. I see thy works. Your tribulation, your pressure, and your poverty. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Who's the real Jews, by the way, today? They say they're Jews and are not. Who is a real Jew today? Well, we've got to look at the scripture. We'll come back to here in a moment. A lot of people don't like this, but it's the truth. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, Romans 2.28. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Who's a Jew today? He is a Jew which is one inwardly. Who are all Jews in God's sight? Everybody who's born again. You and I, we're all Jews. Not Old Testament Jews. New Testament Jews. One is inwardly circumcision of that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So these guys were saying that they were Jews, but in reality, they weren't. So he says, these guys were the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. God does not want us to fear anything at any point, anything that you would ever have any pressure, tri tribulation, or whatever would come against you. In this case, even in this city, there were a lot of evil things going on. You know, in this country, we haven't had these problems, but in other nations, there is tremendous persecution that's going on in some of these nations, especially these Muslim nations. The devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. You have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. I'll give thee a crown of life. There's people that are being martyred throughout the world. But you know what? They're passing the test as they're faithful unto death, and they are going to get the crown of life. Then we come to Pergamos. I see your works, and where thou dwellest, where Satan's seed is, thou holdest fast my name. You and I need to hold fast his name. Not deny the faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, was slain among you. Again, here's another place where there's a lot of martyrdom. Behold, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast been them. Behold, the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to the idols, and to commit fornication. Remember that Balaam, he was all interested in the wages of unrighteousness. He was out for money, and so he was willing to do this. Well, we see the same kind of thing. People do things for money. What do we see a lot of times happen? It's all about the money. They'll sell the messages that they'll teach on the TV or on the radio, is so they'll sell tapes, and so people want to give, you know. And people say, send in your $1,000 vow, and God will heal your mother, or whatever all. Ridiculous claims and all these kind of things. All kinds of crazy things are done for money's sake. And this goes on in the body of Christ. Unfortunately, the body of Christ, because they've been ignorant of the Word of God and has fallen for it and supported these kind of ministries, where well, we have a problem, those people that are wanting to do these kinds of things. Eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. Otherwise, walking in the ways of the flesh and all out for serving, self-serving. He says also, Thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Jesus hates the conquer the laity spirit. Repent, or else I'll come unto thee quickly, will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So here again, we see that he's want, wanting, exhorting them to hold fast his name and do the things that he wants. We've got to confront things. Next church, Thyatira. I see thy works, your charity, it's love. God sees our love, we need to walk in love. He sees your service, you're going to always serve the Lord. Your faith, your patience, your steadfastness, and your works in the last to be more than the first. 
He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, eat things, sacrifice unto idols. The Jezebel spirit. What is the Jezebel spirit? It is a controlling, dominating, manipulating spirit that wants to, wants to control everything and do what it wants to do. Unfortunately, we see it in the churches today. It is not a good thing. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. That's one thing about God. God always gives people space to repent. He give you space to repent. You, you know, he's, you do something wrong. He's not. You know, judgment doesn't come on you like that. He's long suffering. Remember, he wants people to repent. He gives you and I space to repent when we are walking in ways of sin. Well, we don't sit. Oh, I got some space to repent. Well, I wouldn't wait long because you don't know how long that is. We want to be sure we get ourselves right with the Lord. He says, Behold, I'll cast her into a bed, them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. I'll kill her children with death, and all the churches will know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts, and I'll give unto you every one of you according to your works. God is a God of judgment, and judgments will come. A lot of people don't want to think about God as a God of judgment, but he is a God of judgment, and he always does things according to righteousness, never things that are wrong, always according to righteousness, and he's not going to put up with evil. He is going to deal with it. And notice he's going to give every one of us according to our works. That's why our works are very important. I say unto you in the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I'll put none other burden upon them. But he says, that which you have already hold fast till I come. Otherwise God wants us to hold fast to all the things that he's taught us and so that we're going to walk in his ways. He that overcomes or conquers and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. We want to be those that are going to keep his works to the end. Then we see in chapter 3, this is to the church at Sardis, I see thy works. What was the problem with these guys? Thou hast the name that thou livest and are dead. Well, they were living in name, but they were dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. A lot of things have died out in their life. Otherwise, they weren't doing the things that they once did. They weren't seeking the Lord, perhaps, or weren't praying or witnessing or doing all these things. They kind of became just a club, you know, a bless me club, a little church, you know. Well, we, we'll have our own little way and we'll kind of do things the way we want to do. No. The church of Jesus Christ does not do what they want to do. All these churches in the entire world that have their own agenda and their own way of doing things are in trouble. What is our way? What God says. God says do these things, you and I are going to do these things because we're not in control, he's in control because he is the great shepherd of the sheep and he's directing us. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God. God wants our works to be perfect towards before him. See, he wants us to develop in all these things. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. You receive God's word as you hear it, you take hold of it and you hold fast to it. He says, repent, which means change our mind, change our ways. Let's get doing the things that he says. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I'll come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I'll come upon thee. We gotta watch so we don't fall into temptations. Remember it says watch and pray so you don't enter into the temptations. And then he goes on and says, thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. How do we defile our garments? If we're walking in sin, walking in the ways of the flesh or the world. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. What's white? White speaks of righteousness, because they were doing righteousness. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Clothed in righteousness. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. In saying, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, that means someone's name could be blotted out of the book of life. Otherwise, he'd never say it. Why would their name get blotted out of the book of life if they don't repent and deal with themselves? And if they're running around with defiled garments and are not walking in his ways and are not walking worthy before him in righteousness, then they're not going to be clothed with white raiment. Those that are clothed with white raiment, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life and they're going to stay there. That's why we've got to do righteousness, walk in his ways, do his word. It's just simply hearing and doing his word and following him and being obedient to him. And he's not going to blot out your name. Praise God. But that will happen to those. Don't think that shows you once saved, always saves a lying teaching, isn't it? Obviously, 
You could be walking right at one point and then turn away and not walk out any longer and your name could be blotted out. Revelation 3, 7, here it is to Philadelphia. And he speaks here, he says, I see your works. I've set before thee an open door, no man can shut it. Thou hast a little strength. The word is dunamis, little power. They had a little power. God wants us to have power, but he actually wants us to get full of power and have great power. But these guys at least had a little power. And they kept his word and didn't deny his name. See, there was a lot of persecution that was coming against them for the gospel in those days. I'll make them in the synagogue of Satan, which say they're Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. Otherwise, he was going to prove who was the real church and who was the false. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, the word of steadfastness, I'll keep thee from the hour of temptation, which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. As you keep his word, he will keep you from the temptations of the enemy. You see, we can walk in peace and walk in victory and be protected. All this evil will not, you know, the Bible talks about no evil will come and befall you, befall you and no plague come and nigh your dwelling for those that are walking in his ways. If we keep the word of his patience, see, that's where it comes down to. Walking in line with the word of God is essential in your life. Doesn't matter what you feel like, what you think, you just hear and do his word. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That means that uh, somebody could take your crown away if you don't hold fast to the things that he says that we are to do. And we are to conquer. Overcome is always the word nakao, which means to conquer. Then we come to the last church, which was Laodicea. I see thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. That shows you that people that are lukewarm, they aren't going to make it. What's that? What's lukewarm? A combination of the cold and hot. That meant they had the hot, they had the things of God, but they let all this other stuff come in. Diverse seed will contaminate you. You cannot have a little bit of sin, the flesh, the things of the world, and all this cold coming in, and have the things of God and think everything's okay. Oh, I got Jesus, but you know, those other problems, you know, I got all this sin I'm walking in. Oh, no. That makes you lukewarm. God expects us to deal with all the sin in our life. And this is all very important if we're going to pass the spiritual test. This is the word of God to all these churches. He says, I'm going to spew you out. What was their situation? Because thou sayest, I'm rich, increased with goods, of need of nothing. In the natural, they had everything. But he says, knowest not that thou art wretched. They were wretched in God's sight. This is all spiritually. And we talk about this word wretched. It's used one other place, this particular Greek word, one other place in the uh, New Testament. It's in Romans 7.24 when he talks about, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Why were they wretched? Because they were walking after the ways of the body, after the ways of the flesh. If you're walking in the ways of the flesh, God considers you wretched. You're not walking in the Spirit. It says he was miserable. And this one, is used one other time. And this is where in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, where it talks about how they were having hope in this life only, it would have hope in this life only if it wasn't for what Jesus had did and the fact that he had redeemed us and went to the cross and been raised from the dead and so forth. Otherwise, we'd only have hope in our own natural life and then what would we do? It would just be the end. So these guys were people that all they were thinking about was their own natural life and the way things were going instead of thinking about eternity and following the way of the Lord. They were poor, poor in all kinds of ways. They were blind, they couldn't see. They were naked, meaning that they were not clothed. We must not be those that are going to be found naked. And those that are naked, they aren't righteous. The people that don't have, are walking in righteousness, they're naked because they, have, they got uncleanness in them. We need to deal with this. In fact, uh, we'll come back here in just a second. We'll show you this. We showed you the scripture before about how Jesus is walking in the church. It's in Deuteronomy 23, 14. The Lord thy God walks in the midst of the camp. That's a type of the church. To what? To deliver thee. To give up thine enemies before thee. He wants all the enemies to come up so we can get rid of them out of our life. Cast them all out. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. That's the church is to be holy. He that shall see, 
that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. When you put the cursor over the word unclean, it actually is a word which means nakedness. That he see no nakedness in you. Why would someone have nakedness? Because they got all this uncleanness in them. See, part of getting yourself clothed is also getting cleansed. Because it's, we're to be righteous and holy before the Lord. Righteousness because we do righteousness. Holiness because we have fruit of righteousness, but also we have cleansed ourselves of all the filthiness of the flesh and spirit to perfect holiness in the fear of God. See, this is where people think that, well, I'll just do the word of God, everything will be fine. What about all the uncleanness? What about all the devils? What about all these unclean works of the flesh? They got to be cleansed out too, or will never be holy before the Lord. See, we don't want to be found naked. No, we want to cleanse ourselves. We want to get rid of all this evil. And what do we see here after verse 17? He goes on and he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. When we talk about the gold tried in the fire, that speaks of his word, his words, what's tried in the fire. And it's going to cost you something in the sense, not money. It's going to cost you time and effort to seek after it. That's why it talks about buying. Buying costs you something, doesn't it? We're not talking about you can't buy it with money, physical. It's going to cost you something with your effort to seek and to search after the scriptures and study to show yourself approved and get the word of God in you. And it says here that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, that's righteousness, that thou mayest be clothed. We've got to be righteous before him. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. The anoint thine eyes with eyes salve. We've got to be able to see. Our eyes got to be open that thou mayest see. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be thou zealous, therefore, and repent. If there's any areas of sin in your life, God is coming to rebuke you and to chasten you, to correct you. And he says, be zealous and repent. Turn away from it. Don't let any areas of sin be in your life. Don't let these evil spirits stay in you. Don't let yourself walk in the flesh or the ways of the world. Walk with the Lord. Then he goes on and says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. We've got to hear his voice. We've got to allow him to come in. What's the door? It's the door of our heart. He's knocking. If we'll open up, he'll come in, he'll fellowship with us, and we will walk in his ways. God wants us to conquer and do everything that he says. A couple more scriptures before we close. Revelation 21 verse 7 says, he that overcometh, conquers, shall inherit all things. And I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. If you want to pass the spiritual test, you're going to, spiritual test in life, you're going to conquer. You're going to conquer sin. You're going to conquer the world. You're going to conquer flesh. You're going to conquer the devil. What do we see? They had to conquer everything. And you've got to conquer all the evil. You see, we're following the Lord. And you are training for reigning in the life to come. This isn't just like walking my ways and make it through and, you know, everything will be fine. Oh, Jesus will love me and bless me and all these great things. Oh, that's ridiculous thinking. God has given you his word. He's tr you're training because if you are going to reign with him for a thousand years, do you think you're going to reign if you haven't learned how to reign over your enemies now in your life? If you can't conquer in this life, since when are you going to reign in the life to come? You're kidding yourself. And you say, well, i got all these problems and all these situations i got to deal with. You can conquer every enemy in your life. I don't care how bad your situation is. Remember the man from Gadar? He ran and fell down and worshipped him, and he was out there totally out of his mind out there in the tombs. And yet he could come to him to get delivered. You can, God's given you authority. You can cast out every devil. You can deal with every sin. You can overcome and conquer everything in your life. You're well able to overcome and possess everything that he has for you. What happens to the other guys? The fearful, unbelieving, abominable murderers, whoremongers, sor sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, they're going to end up in the lake that burns with fire, which is the second death. Now, we're going to pass the test. One last scripture we see in Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. The word do, you've got to understand, this isn't, I, I did his commandments once. No. It's not what it is. Present tense. Present tense in the Greek means continuous, repeated action. That's why Young's translates it, those are, are those doing his commands. 
We're doing his commands. Otherwise, this is what you live by. You live by the word. This is all we do. We live by the word. We do what he does. We stay in fellowship with him. We walk with him. We learn his ways. And God's going to, blessings are going to come on us. We're going to see great things. He's going to use us mightily. We're going to be in the warfare against the enemy. But we're going to do what he says. That the authority, this is what it literally says, that the authority, right means authority, it's exousia, shall be theirs unto the tree of life. This is correct the way he's translated this in the Greek. Otherwise, you're going to have authority to the tree of life because you've been doing his commands. If you don't do his commands, you will not have authority to the tree of life. And that by the gates they may enter into the city. A lot of strong things that we brought forth today in this evening. We see the fact that what essentially we see. We've got to walk the walk, don't we? These guys didn't compromise. They were witnesses. They confronted the enemies, whether it was the devil out there, people out there trying to stop the gospel. They'd cast out the devils. They weren't compromised. Even when counterattacks came against them, they got thrown in the prison. They're still going to praise and worship God and pray and preach the gospel and do the things of God. We're going to do what he says, and God's going to deliver us. God's your source. We're going to follow the word and do everything he says, as we've seen. He's not going to, we're not going to compromise for anything. And we're not going to be those who are going to draw back. We're going to walk the walk. You are in this for life. This is your life. Jesus is your life. Don't ever leave your first love. You hold fast. You continue to walk in his ways. You walk and have the white raiment on of righteousness and do what he says. Don't let any sin reign in your life. Don't walk in the ways of the flesh or the things of this world. Hearken unto his voice, and you will pass the spiritual tests in life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for your word. Your word this night has shown me that I cannot compromise and that I must be willing to confront everything that is evil, everything in my life that is not of you has to be confronted and has to be eliminated. And I'm also going to be a witness for you. And I'm going to confront the evil out there in the world. I can't be a closet Christian. I have to be one who represents you. And I'm going to speak your word. And I'm going to confront the evil. And cast out the devils. And destroy the works of the enemy. I am going to pass the test. And I am going to walk in your ways. You see all my works. You see my labor. You see my love. You see my steadfastness. You see all that I do. I am going to walk in your ways. And I will never draw back. I will never be lukewarm. I will be hot for you. And as I obey you and follow you, I'm going to get a crown of life. And I'm going to conquer the enemy. And I'm going to inherit all things. And I'm going to be one of those. Continually doing your commandments. And I'll have authority to the tree of life. And I'll be able to partake of it. And enter into the gates of the city, the New Jerusalem. Thank you, Lord. I've made my decision. I'm passing all the spiritual tests. I'm walking the walk. Regardless of what comes, I will not compromise. I will hear and do your word. And I will be approved of you. Thank you, Lord. There'll be much fruit from this message as I hear and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. This part of the message was a pretty strong message compared to like this morning, which was a little different than we talked about. But all these things all combined into passing the spiritual tests. We're going to do it. We're going to walk the walk. No room for us to play, play church. No room for us to be a closet Christian. No room for us to just do things the way I want to do it. Well, this is the way I believe, or this is the way I'm going to do it. We're in a mess if we do that. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23? If any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what you and I must do. You see, you've entered into a covenant with him. And this covenant, you have the word of the covenant, and God's expecting us to do it. 
were to carry out the word of the covenant. When you dare carry out the word of the covenant, God has sworn by himself, because he could swear by no greater, he will perform all the promises of the covenant, including you entering into eternal life and seeing all the rewards that God wants to bring forth. This life is a vapor compared to eternity. It's just like that compared to eternity. What are we going to do in this life? This is your time. This is my time. I got to do the same thing. I'm responsible to do the same thing that you're responsible to do because we're all under Jesus Christ. And I've got to walk the walk and you've got to walk the walk so that we're going to be approved of God. Sell out your whole life to follow Jesus. It is going to pay good dividends in the life to come. You are going to be rewarded according to your works. Do not let yourself fall back away from the things of God. That's why I don't waste my time with any of these things of the world. I'm in the Word and studying the Word, thinking on the Word, praying the Word, acting on the Word, doing the Word, whatever. That is my life. I don't know about you. That's the way I'm walking. You see it in what I bring forth. And you, just, you, come over, you come over to my house and you'll see me in front of the computer and got all the studying. And that's all I do. Just studying the Word, doing all these things besides the normal necessities, of course, that you do in life. But not wasting my time with all this other stuff. Walking the walk. That's what you and I are going to do. And we're going to be approved before God. Hallelujah. Praise God for what He's going to do. It's, it's an exciting life. It's a blessed life. It's a fruitful life. It's a holy life. It's a way of the Lord. And God's going to change you and transform you. You're going to be changed in every way. We want to be changed. We're going to go from faith to faith, strength to strength, glory to glory. That's what God wants. He wants to raise you up to be strong. I'll tell you what God wants, what I, what's in my heart. He wants every one of you to get so strong and mighty and powerful in this church that we are a tremendous light to wherever we are so that God can accomplish what he purposes. That's what every other church is supposed to be too. We don't, you know, we encourage, uh, hope I'll, I'll pray for all the other churches to do the same thing. God wants everybody here. That we're going to rise up and we are going to be mighty for the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for all that you brought forth this night. Thank you that your word has gripped our heart. Thank you, Lord, we're going to come in line with all of these principles because we are going to be the holy, righteous church that's walking in your ways. It's going to be a glorious church that we are going to be a part of, that you're going to come back for without spot, without wrinkle, holy and without blemish before you. Thank you, Lord, that we're going to be presented unrebukable, unreprovable, without blame before you under the coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for much fruit as we hear and do your word. In Jesus' name, amen.